Can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to wait a few, uh, we're going to wait a minute or so until people start uh, joining. Can you all hear me? Great, great, great. Thank you, guys. Let's see. All right, I'm going to give about another minute. Let me give it one more minute and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start. Wish I had some music playing for everyone. Uh, maybe next time. So uh, I'm gonna speak for uh, about 10 minutes before I start introducing some of the guests uh, and they'll speak for about five minutes each uh, to give their perspective on what's happening uh, from their point of view. And at, uh, after the elected official speak, we actually have a lawyer uh, who specializes on uh, helping freelancers uh, collect non-payment, which I know it's a big issue for a lot of you uh, who have not gotten paid uh, because of the excuse of this pandemic hitting. So hopefully that information is, hope, uh, is helpful to you. I know in New York, we have the, free, the Freelancers and Free Act, uh, but in other parts of the country, uh, there is there is very little uh, legal recourse that you can take. So this lawyer is going to take this very broad, narrow, uh, broad, broad approach so that you can have the information you need on how to how to collect that payment. Uh, so, um, I'm going to begin now that we're two minutes in, and just for the sake of time. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to our first. Uh, State of the Freelancers Union. I'm Rafael Espinal. I am the president of the Freelancers Union. Uh, tonight's conversation is uh, going to focus on the purposes and the services offered by the union, the work we hope to do during the COVID pandemic, and my vision on where do we go after the pandemic. It's important to note that we do have listeners from across the country. Now, it doesn't matter uh, from where you're tuning in from. We're gonna, we're all facing the same challenges, and we're gonna take an approach in which we'll be able to give answers that will answer all of your questions. You know, these are federal programs that were created, so they will be the same across the country. Uh, every state uh, does have a different approach on how to implement it. I think, I think the difference is mostly in time uh, that you all have to wait in order to receive uh, those benefits. And what I've been hearing over the past few weeks and the survey we have done as a union, uh, we uh, know that over 70% of freelancers uh, across the country have either lost work uh, or losing work and over 90% expect to lose work in the next few weeks and, and months. Uh, and applying for the programs like unemployment insurance and the pandemic unemployment assistance uh, program and PPP have all been a confusing nightmare. Uh, we received hundreds of questions uh, since we announced that we're going to have this this uh, this talk today. Many with related concerns. So I hope to be able to shed some of the clarity as I speak uh, and be able to provide you with all, the, with all the information I have and help. And hopefully, the elected officials who come in uh, will be able to provide some insight as well. They'll be able to answer your questions. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't feel your answer, what your question was answered, just know that we do have. Um, all of your questions uh, through email, uh, and we're going to make sure that our team and our staff is doing everything they can to answer them. So uh, do expect a little bit of uh, difficulties, uh, being that this is all done through my cell phone. So uh, please uh, hang with me. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you again. Uh, I'm Rafael Espin. I'm the president of the Freelancers Union. I became the president back in uh, March 2nd. It's been a little bit over a month. Uh, but before I became the president, I actually was an elected official for eight years of my life. When I was 26, I ran for the New York State Assembly. I won. 
Uh, then after the New York State Assembly, I decided to run for the New York City Council, uh, which I served for six and a half years uh, before uh, leaving and joining the union. You know, in my time in the city council, I worked on issues uh, heavily around environmental uh, issues. Uh, for example, I was the leading voice in banning single-use plastics in, in New York City. Uh, I uh, worked on the Freelancers and Free Act as the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee. And I also introduced a law uh, that that actually uh, prohibits your employer from uh, being able to call you after hours uh, because we all know it was called the Right to Disconnect Act and it was a way to provide you the protection you need in case you needed some downtime uh, to deal with anxiety. So the reason I left elected office, it wasn't an easy decision, but it was one that I thought it was an, it was an important one because I knew the union was doing important work in providing services and support and advocacy on behalf of a population that I believe historically uh, has been uh, left behind and, and often not uh, ignored by our city, state, and federal government. And I, and I know that the freelancer, freelancers in general uh, provide such a great deal uh, of, of support for our city. Uh, they make huge contributions uh, to where our cities operate. I think that the, the fact that the reason New York City is so great is because all of the creatives and all of the uh, different independents that exist here and contribute uh, to our city's economy. And I knew that it was important for freelancers to have a voice that understood government uh, and, that, and, and, that, and that was dedicated uh, to lifting your voices and making sure that uh, all levels of government was uh, dealing with your issues and needs. Um, the union was created a little over 20 years ago uh, by Sarah Horowitz uh, as a way to organize freelancers and promote the interests of workers through advocacy, education, and services. It is now the largest and fastest growing organization representing freelancers. So all of you who have joined, thank you for joining. Uh, over the past few weeks, we have seen an extreme jump in the amount of membership, and it really, really helps that you continue uh, uh, encouraging your friends who have not joined yet to please join the union. Uh, as, as we continue to build our numbers, we build a stronger unified voice, and we'll be, we'll be able to get a lot more done uh, moving forward. Uh, so those of you who didn't join, it's free to join the union. It only takes a few seconds. Just go on our website, freelancersunion.org. Uh, we provide uh, a lot of different services, for example, uh, insurance, uh, if you need insurance, whether it be health, liability, it's available to you there to join, and these uh, plans and policies are tailored for you, but also if you, if you uh, uh, opt in into these, into these uh, uh, insurance plans, uh, your, your membership uh, helps, helps fuel the advocacy that the, that the union is doing and the work that we're doing. Uh, there are other free member benefits uh, that you do not have to buy into at all, like discounts to services uh, from many of our partners. If you need a discount to gym membership, if you need a discount on building a website, getting some, getting some business cards, uh, you're able to get uh, allowed to uh, uh, use discounts through, through our partners. There's a whole list. You go on our website, check it out. And if you live in New York City, uh, you get access to our Freelancers Hub, which is in Brooklyn. It's a free co-working space, uh, which I hope to expand to other cities across the country. Uh, and in this space, uh, you, do, you get free co-working, uh, free workshops, free legal help, and there's also benefits assistance. Uh, those workshops that we provide usually at the Hub are now being live streamed uh, through, the, through the Freelancers Hub Instagram. And it's all, it's all programs that are tailored to providing you with workforce development. So I encourage you to go on to the Freelancers Hub uh, Instagram, uh, and they're providing uh, events uh, usually a few times throughout the week. Tomorrow they actually have one. You should check in and see if it's helpful to, uh, to you. We also have our monthly member meetups. Uh, it's, the, it's called Spark. Uh, we are currently in 22 different cities across the country. It's a way to meet other members, participate in career building workshops, and also organize on local issues. So if you want to attend one in your city, there's more info again on our website. And if there isn't one in your city and you want to create a Spark uh, a member program in your city, uh, please reach out to us and we can help you become a leader and you can begin organizing freelancers uh, within your city uh, as, 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 uh, as, as through, through, our, through our union. And lastly, of course, we are your advocacy arm on issues as they arise, like COVID relief or the creation of new legislation like the Freelancers of Free Act. Uh, just to give you some points on how the Freelancers of Free Act, those of you who, of you who are in New York City and are probably a little more familiar with it, um, you are lucky. Uh, other cities across the country do not have uh, legislation like this put in the books yet. Uh, the, the Freelancers and Free Act gives free, uh, freelancers uh, legal recourse to collect unpaid invoices of $800 or more 
from clients and it protects you from retaliation as well, which I know is an issue a lot of you are facing and concerned about right now. Uh, the Freelance Isn't Free Act also allows the city to intervene and help you uh, collect those payments. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually working for a lot of people in New York City, which is why it's imp I feel it's important that as a union and, and as freelancers, we, we begin advocating uh, for that law to be passed in, in our respective cities. So as the president of the union, my goal is to build a 50-state freelancers movement. I want to ensure that freelancers are at the table and being considered when decisions are being made. Right now is a real opportunity to build and become a unified voice. And we do that by reaching out to other independent workers and educating them and including them into these conversations. If we are able to continue building, we will easily be able to expand on all of the great work and services that the union has been able to build here in New York City and create them uh, where you live. We can build more freelance hubs, hopefully targeted to your profession, expand the Freelancers in Free Act so that everyone has the same support and protections, and have enough advocates on the ground to push for our governments to create a wider social safety net for independent workers. So, And also when things uh, begin going back to normal, my original plan was to actually travel uh, across the country to the many different cities and begin these conversations. So in the near future, I hope to be able to find time and spaces for us to meet and for me to be able to get a firsthand account of how the union can help you. Uh, for now, uh, we have to ensure, so for now, I know a lot of the questions already come about PUA and unemployment insurance. Um, for now, we have to ensure that you are all taking advantage of all the resources that currently exist because of the CARES Act. Now, we all fought very hard to ensure that freelancers were included. Uh, so. So, for example, the stimulus check, if you earned less than $99,000 last year, please check to see if you received your stimulus payment. Uh, those have been going out the past few days. If you're unemployed, again, go to your state's unemployment agency and apply for unemployment insurance. And apply also for the Paycheck Protections Program and SBA's EIDL loan. The PPP and EIDL are both loan programs that can be turned into grants. And there's been a lot of questions on where, on how these, all of these are going to work and whether you can claim all of them or whether you can only apply for one of them. Uh, you cannot accept both the PPP and the EIDL loan. So if you did get approved for both of them or you did apply for both of them, when, if, you get, if, you get, if you get accepted, you must decline one um, to ensure that you don't get into any issues down the line. So just when you, if you get approved for both PPP and EIDL loans, Accept one. If you if you only applied for one, just apply for that one. There are also questions around whether you can apply for PPP or EIDL in conjunction with UI, uh, unemployment insurance, and PUA. Currently, there are no rules around you not being able to file for unemployment and also applying for the PPP loans. So I encourage you, uh, my recommendation is for you to do both uh, until other, other, uh, you know, other guidances uh, have, been, have been sent by the federal government. Right now, there are no issues if you try to apply for both the unemployment insurance and one of the other uh, grants programs that exist. The Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP program, is there to, and used to cover payroll and some costs like rent. Eight weeks worth of payroll is forgivable. So you may ask, well, I'm a self-employed. There is no payroll. Your revenue, what you earn throughout the year, that is considered your payroll. Uh, so this program is there for you. So the PPP is to pay for your payroll, your revenue that you're making throughout the year. Uh, if you rent the studio, 25% of the loan can be used to pay for that as well. Uh, and that also will be forgivable. Uh, and that's eight weeks. I know a lot of us are having a hard time getting that loan because we don't have a business checking account, which is also a big deal. A lot of, uh, a lot of freelancers uh, have been going to the local bank branches. They're being told that because they don't have a business checking account, that they don't qualify. Um, there are exactly, there are, there are banks out there, or smaller banks, smaller lenders that are taking on new clients. So I encourage you uh, to find out who those banks are on our blog at blog.freelancersunion.org. Uh, we actually have an article that links you to, to all of the banks that exist, and it also uh, highlights which, which small lenders uh, will accept new customers. So please look for that uh, and, and, and uh, make use of that program. 
For unemployment insurance, I think it's also uh, important uh, to to uh, highlight um, that it's, of course, it's different in every state. Um, at the end of the day, every state is going to have a version of PUA unemployment insurance available to you, uh, but but some of them are taking more times than others. Uh, the federal government at this point has released all of the guidelines and information on how to qualify and apply. For but for example, in states like Massachusetts. Uh, they're going to uh, release uh, their, their websites and applications of how to apply for that at the end of the month. So those of you in Mass and other states will have, probably have to wait another, another week or so uh, for your state to catch up, create a portal uh, that is uh, compliable with, with the applications for uh, independent contractors. So at the end of the day, you just have to be patient. Unfortunately, that is a situation we are in. There's not much we can do around that, uh, but you have to apply. You will not qualify for unemployment insurance. You will not qualify for unemployment insurance if you're still working. Uh, even if you're working part-time, you have to be careful because if you're making more than $504 a week, uh, that can disqualify you from both unemployment insurance and the pandemic unemployment assistance. Uh, so if you're doing a little side hustle and you're earning a, a few hundred bucks, you have to make sure that it does not it, that those those bucks are not over than what the state allows for unemployment for the week because that would automatically disqualify you from both. So it's important uh, that you do that. And okay, so now I got some of that information out there. I wanted to get it out there. I know some of some of my guests have actually uh, signed on and joined already. Uh, these are these are like the officials that I've uh, invited, uh, folks that are are good friends of mine that I've worked with closely on many different issues that I cared about. Uh, I know that we have Senator Jessica Ramos from New York State. She is the chair of uh, the um, Labor Committee in the state of New York. Uh, she's also a state senator who represents uh, parts of Queens, where um, where where they're dealing uh, heavily with with the with the pandemic. So I really appreciate her taking the time and her being here with us. I'm going to invite her on to say a few words about what's going on in uh, in Albany and the state level, and and uh, on and any any insights you can give us around unemployment insurance and and what's going on in the state. So I'm I'm calling her now. Hey, Jessica, how you doing? Hey, Rafael, how are you? Hello, I'm good. Thanks. Answers. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And um, not only do I want to thank you for having me. But also say hello to all the freelancers uh, who are home watching. Thank you for all you do. We know that you are going through dire straits, many of you, given the current state of our economy. Um, we know that the crisis of the pandemic isn't obviously just medical. And um, Rafael mentioned it. I actually represent the epicenter of the uh of the COVID-19 crisis here, um, Elmhurst Hospital is just two blocks away from where I live, from where we are right now. <laughs> um, and a lot of our people have been hurting, um, employed, self-employed, freelancers. Um, it's a virus that hasn't discriminated um, and um, has really uh, left people wondering how they're going to be able to pay rent um, when May 1st rolls around in a couple of weeks. Uh, we know that's especially true for many freelancers who obviously do not qualify for regular unemployment insurance. And I know that we've been talking about that a little bit, um, but uh, I guess sign joining early on gave me the benefit of seeing some of the comments that you guys have all written. And yes, the PWA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program has been slow to start everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere. Yep. There is not a state where PUA is working. It is called the failure of our federal government. Um, we have not received appropriate guidance in order how to, to fully implement the program. And this is a huge issue because here in New York State, and I see that there are many New Yorkers joining us. Hey, guys. Hey, New Yorkers. Um, is that our Department of Labor has been so underfunded for such a freaking long time that we didn't have the capacity to answer the phone calls, the emails, process the applications from, for everybody. So now that we're going to have to add even more capacity because now you guys, you entrepreneurs, are going to need to come into uh, that essentially that same process, that same system, um, I'm going to need your help. 
And that's why I'm here. And that's why I accepted this invitation. <laughs> we need Governor Cuomo to hear us loud and clear. The Department of Labor needs increased resources in terms of streamlining mm -hmm. our process, in terms of building capacity and making sure that everyone really is getting that phone call that they're promised um, after 72 hours, especially now that we're going to have all of you jo jo joining that line. Look, uh, from what we've heard, PWA is really only going to kick in starting with the loss of wages um, that ended on April 12th for that week. Um, like regular unemployment insurance, and this is why we talk about it, even though, yes, it's not applicable to you guys necessarily, is that the process should, we expect it to mirror the unemployment uh, insurance process greatly, meaning that you'll likely have to answer about 20 questions here in New York. Um, it used to be 150 questions. Now it's 20 questions that you must answer. Um, and they'll reach out to you if they need any more information or to confirm any information to continue promises, prom uh, processing your request. But from then on out, you should be receiving a check every week. This is what we're expecting. Um, but again, just, you know, please uh, stay up to date. Stay on us. You can stay on me if you're in New York. Um, obviously, stay in touch with your union because as soon as we receive more clearer guidance, we're going to be uh, screaming it from the rooftops and mm -hmm. we're going to need all of you to help us reach everyone else who isn't paying attention. You know? Well, yeah, well, thank you, Senator. That was really helpful and it's great to have a voice like yours uh, advocating on behalf of the freelancers and all those workers who are trying to access these benefits. Uh, outside from unemployment insurance, I know there's a conversation about what else can the state do to provide relief just for, just for residents in general, right? For example, suspending rent. Is that a conversation that's happening? Is You think that's something that's going to be real and would it move forward? As of right now, it's a conversation that every New Yorker is having except the governor. Look, mm -hmm. um, we are uh, asking the governor, who, by the way, um, froze mortgages for 90 days. And this expires at the end of June, by the way, by those 90 days. And he has gotten rid of uh, evictions during this time as well. That also expires at the end of June. We'll see if he renews uh, those executive orders. But... We need him to cancel rent. No one can afford mm -hmm. rent. We need people right. to stay home. It means they have to have a home. It means that they need to be able to afford food. It means that we need you to, you know, afford your medicine if you're feeling under the weather and we know that you're not sick enough to go to a hospital. Yes, mm -hmm. stay home. Um, but uh, this is why we need him to cancel rent. My colleague in the state Senate, uh, Senator Mike Gennaris, is carrying the bill to cancel rent. Um, there's also another bill by Senator Brian Kavanaugh that is proposing a rent subsidy for those who have been hardest hit. Um, but nevertheless, the quickest solution to all this is an executive order from the governor. If he can put his hand on his heart and understand that there are too many New Yorkers during these trying times because the cost of living here is so damn high to begin with. Yeah. Um, and, and now it's just getting harder and harder. Look, I'm a renter too. I'm a legislator. So my salary is, op is public information. I make a hundred grand a year. Um, and yet my rent is 50% of my income. I have two kids. Um, and you know, for me, it's hard to figure things out sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine for those who don't have a stable income. Um, so I, I sympathize with you. I'm here in solidarity because what we want is solidarity, not charity, yep. right? What we want is public policy that works for working people. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here and continue working with you, Rafael, to, to serve our freelancers and do what's right by them. Thank you so much, Jessica. And anyone, everyone who's following, this is uh, Senator Jessica Ramos. She's from Queens. I encourage you to follow her. She's the chair of labor for the state of New York. Uh, she's, she's, she's working a lot of issues that affect you. Uh, she's a great person personally and as a legislator. Follow Jessica Ramos. So thank you, Senator. I really appreciate you coming on and giving yeah. us an update. Hi. I appreciate having you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Talk Bye, soon. Guys. Bye. All right. Uh, so thank you again, Jessica. Um, we, we, we are waiting... Uh, for Senator uh, Scott Weiner from uh, California, uh, who's also going to come in and give us an update.
Um, I'm not sure if he's on yet. Uh, let me just take a look if he's here. I don't see him. Um, Senator, if you're on, just please shoot me a message uh, on the message board down there, and we'll try to we'll try to find a way to get you on. So, just to go back uh, to to some of the facts that you need to know uh, around uh, unemployment insurance. Uh, I know through the application process, there has also uh, been uh, some some confusion. Oh, Scott, Scott's with us. Senator's with us. Uh, let's see how we get you on. Um, trying to figure this out, guys. So give me a second. Let me try to find the center. It's going to be tough. Where is all right? I'm trying to get you on. Maybe if you if you sign out and come back in, I'll they'll, they'll prompt me to allow you in, Senator. Oh wait, I got you. <clears throat> Senator, what's up, man? How are you? Hey, here I am. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah, thanks for joining us and taking the time. Yeah, sorry, you have much better lighting than I do. <laughs> I'm by the window. So, uh -huh. So, uh, everyone, this is Senator Scott Weiner. Uh, he, he's a senator in California. He represents uh, San Francisco. Uh, we actually met uh, because we both have similar <laughs> interests around supporting our city's nighttime economy. Uh, we understand that our city's nighttime economy played a crucial role in uh, supporting small businesses, but also providing spaces for our artists uh, and freelancers to be able to do their work. So that's what I thought. That's why I thought it'd be great to have you on, Senator, uh, to give us an update what's happening in California and your point of view, and any any uh, any update around unemployment insurance that California sure. is taking on, because uh, a lot of freelancers, not only in California but across the country, uh, have been have been having issues applying uh, for the for for that program because of the systems and the applications that have all been changed and the recent yeah. regulations that came out of the federal government. Um, yeah, well, thank you for having me, and thanks for the work that you are uh, doing to support uh, some of the most. Uh, at-risk workers uh, economically because of the way that our system is set up. Uh, and speaking of nightlife, I, uh, uh, I am very, very concerned about our nighttime economy, uh, the hospitality uh, industry in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Entertainment is being just so decimated by this pandemic. Uh, but in particular, uh, at least we know that restaurants at some point will be able to open up with more spacing, it seems, at least in California. Um, and uh, but for, uh, you know, nightclubs and larger bars, it's going to be a, a lot harder. And so mm -hmm. very concerned, especially we have so many uh, bartenders and uh, security people and promoters and DJs mm -hmm. uh, in, our, in our nightlife who are really hurting right now. We're actually doing, there's some fundraising going on here for our queer nightlife, uh, but mm. it's hard um, yeah. So um, in terms of unemployment, uh, I heard uh, the, uh, the, the senator speaking, and uh, I think I try to remind people that um, all 50 states are struggling with rolling out this unemployment. Uh, we had more unemployment applications in California in a few weeks than we had all of last year. And so the system has been deluged. Um, uh, we've had some frustrations with our um, uh, EDD, which is our uh, unemployment agency. Um, but mm -hmm. I think it is, it is gradually stabilizing. Uh, and so now for W-2 employees, uh, people, they're, they're telling us that the turnaround for those unemployment applications are three weeks, which is what it normally is. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, again, for, the, for, for W-2 employees um, and, for, and for freelancers, um, if you, uh, but if the W-2 employee, for example, has been approved for the base unemployment, which is a maximum of 450 a week uh, in California, um, even though the, the 600 extra federal payment was, has not been available until just a few days ago because the feds hadn't transferred the money, um, people will automatically get that and retroactively without having to apply again. Um, in terms of freelancers, this has been a real um, a little bit of a mess that's getting cleaned up because uh, the, I guess the federal government until this past weekend had not provided any guidance to California and I assume New York and other states as well about how to implement it. They finally gave that guidance 
Uh, and so California is getting ready um, to ensure that freelancers, independent contractors, self-employed people, et cetera, um, are able to access the benefits. Um, what we have been um, told uh, by our Department of Labor, they told us yesterday, is that two weeks from yesterday, so April 28th, um, the website, the portal will be up and running. It's frustrating that's going to take them two weeks, but they mm -hmm. feel like they need to. What they don't want to do is put up a, a shoddy system, create a shoddy system that causes all sorts of problems for people. Mm -hmm. apply. They, they say they want to get it right, and it's going to take them two weeks to do that in a rock-solid way. What they've also said is that as of, 20, as of April 28th, when the freelancer um, et al. Um, portal goes live, that when people apply then, uh, it'll take 24 to 48 hours for them to send out, to load your debit card, because it's a Bank of America debit card, 24 mm -hmm. to 48 hours. So even though there's a two week delay now, it'll be, a, according to the Department of Labor, and I'm praying that they're right, um, it'll be a, uh, a very quick uh, turnaround to get that money onto the debit card. And that'll be the, um, the under, sorry for that phone in the background, <laughs> the, the underlying unemployment uh, plus uh, the 600. Hold on, let me just- uh, Yeah, 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 no problem, take your time. Apologies for that. No um, worries, no worries. One of the old timers, I still have a landline. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, what we do recommend though, is for people to go onto the EDD website, edd.ca.gov, set up your account right now. Um, don't apply now, don't apply until April 28th, but get your account all set up now so that on the 28th, you don't have to worry about setting up the account. You can just quickly um, uh, apply. Um, in addition, you will be able to get the base unemployment um, you can get, if you were, if you became uh, unemployed um, as early as early February due to COVID-19, uh, you can get that retroactive until then. Uh, for the 600 extra payment, uh, the, you, you can uh, get it retroactive to March 29th. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So it's just a matter of everyone just being patient. Uh, we're updating our systems. We received guidance from the federal government a little too late. And let's just react as uh, quickly as we can. Uh, and unfortunately, that's just, that's just the case, right? We just have to wait until everything's up and running. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and I, it's been frustrating for all of us. So many people are hurting now. A lot of people couldn't make rent on April. Mm -hmm. And maybe that up to 1050 a week, that, that 4200 a month max, for maximum, that, that can help a lot of people pay their rent or at least pay a chunk of their rent. So they don't have a lot of back rent due when this is uh, yep. trending down. Uh, but when people aren't able to get anything, they start accruing the back rent. So we're hoping that within a few weeks, people will start to get all the back unemployment and can maybe start uh, digging out uh, of that hole. Uh, I, I also just want to uh, mention my office has put together an amazing one pager with links and just information, which we're sending out to constituents when they contact us. Uh, if you want to contact my uh, district office, or we're happy to send it uh, to you, uh, uh, to, you know, Rafael, to, to mm -hmm. distribute for California. Yeah, please do. We're happy to do that. Yeah, please do. We'll make sure we get that out. Um, so any, any conversations around other forms of relief is for Californians in general, uh, whether you freelance or not? As I mentioned uh, to Jessica Ramos, in New York, for example, there's a, there's a bill to suspend rent. Uh, in California, is there anything around housing vouchers or any sort of relief? Yeah, and I first of all, I want to um, make sure. I, I really hope, I, and I don't, you know, know if this is even possible. It would be great if the next federal stimulus had a big chunk of money for uh, for rent um, mm -hmm. for, um, for to help people make rent. Um, in California, we have uh, legislation pending, which I'm a co-author of. Uh, it was introduced. It's Assembly Bill. 828 introduced by um, assembly member Phil Ting, who represents the west side of San Francisco. I'm co-authoring it and others are as well. Um, and what it does is it puts a strong statewide moratorium on evictions. Some cities have enacted strong moratoriums. Uh, the statewide moratorium that was issued by executive order is not broad enough. So this Got will do, put a strong moratorium on. Uh, and then what we want to avoid is people having to pay months of back rent right out of this uh, emergency. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And so it, it allows people to, to repay that back rent over a 12 month period and then reduces the rent uh, by a degree during that 12 month period so that people aren't overwhelmed. Um, it's gonna be a work in progress. Uh, uh, and we're, we are uh, in recess right now because of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Our hope is to go back in session on May 4th uh, and try to move some of these bills. I also have uh, separate legislation, SB 939, to put a moratorium on evictions for commercial tenants, for small businesses, and for nonprofits. Uh, so that mm -hmm. if nonprofits and small businesses are struggling so much, we don't want to have uh, some sort of uh, mass extinction events right. for small businesses and nonprofits, and we want them to at least have a shot of being able to reopen, to go into hibernation now, and at least have their office or retail space available for when this is over. Right, definitely. Well, thank you, Senator. I really appreciate you taking yeah. the time and giving us a, a, a brief check-in of what's happening. Uh, just to like recap, uh, I know people are asking what is EDD. EDD is the uh, Unemployment... The employment, the employment Development Division of the Department of Labor, EDD. That is where you go to get unemployment, edd.ca.gov. I will also just note one thing. Our Secretary of Labor, so the, the, the Workforce and, excuse me, the Labor and Workforce Development Agency, um, the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development is now doing a couple times a week Facebook Lives. So if you go to the California Department of Labor and Workforce Development, there was one yesterday uh, I think they've realized that they need to be much more open, not transparent about exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Governor Newsom in his daily briefing that he talked about this extensively. So if you go to their Facebook page and follow it, there will be Facebook live uh, town halls to try to give updates. Great. Well, Sen Senator, just before you go, uh, can you uh, just enlighten us on why it's important for freelancers to begin to organize now, especially more than ever? Uh, yeah, so I think we, you know, we, we sometimes, in terms of the legalities and public policy, we live in um, a, a different world from the past that doesn't always acknowledge the modern realities. And freelancers have been around forever. And even though we have the fight about who's an employee and who's an independent contractor, who's a freelancer, and that is an ongoing conversation. I know we've had a lot of controversy in California um, about 85. Um, which resulted from a uh, California Supreme Court decision. Had we not passed AB5, uh, it would have been even more extreme than uh, some view it as now. Uh, and that's going to be a work in progress uh, for over the next few years to make sure that we are not uh, inappropriately reclassifying freelancers as employees. We want to make sure we get it right for who's an employee and who's a freelancer. We don't want mm -hmm. people to be confused who are clearly employees but are being treated as independent contractors. Right. But for people who are actually freelancers, and there are a huge number of you, we want to make sure that you are able to continue to earn uh, your living. Uh, but the law just doesn't always, ha we, we, I think co well, I, I, we will get back to quote unquote normal. Uh, mm -hmm. after the team we've had after every other health pandemic. Um, but I want us to get back to normal only in the good ways, like human interaction and going, right, out, right. going to big sports events and having conventions yeah. and, and living our lives. Um, but I don't want to get back to the bad normal, which is a mm -hmm. society that has effectively very little safety net because this pandemic is casting a huge spotlight yeah. on the lack of a safety net, mm -hmm. the horrible ways in which this country treats undocumented immigrants who aren't even covered uh, in the federal stimulus. We're doing that here in California to try to help. Um, when we look at the fact that you have kids who have to do remote learning and they may not have a computer in their house or they right. may not have internet access and we're having to scramble to make sure that everyone has an iPad or a laptop mm -hmm. at a hotspot. Uh, when we look at the health disparities, there's a reason why you know our communities of color, particularly you know, black and Latino communities are ha a disproportionate health impacts with COVID-19 because for decades, for centuries, Mm -hmm. We have allowed uh, the huge economic disparities, the healthcare access disparities. When you look at asthma rates and severity of asthma uh, mm -hmm. among you know communities of color, uh, it, it, yes, a respiratory uh, virus uh, uh, disease is going mm -hmm. to have that kind of bad impact. And so we've exposed all of these. 
problems and flaws in our society that have been ignored for far too long. And we don't want to go back to that normal because that's a bad normal. We need exactly. health care. We need to deal with environmental justice and pollution. We need to deal with health care and economic disparities. Uh, mm -hmm. and make sure using this as a platform to start lifting up our low income working class communities. Exactly. And I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you, Senator. It's been great having you on. Thank Again, you. follow Senator Scott Weiner from San Francisco, uh, represents California. Thank you, for, thank you again for joining us, and let's stay in touch. Thank you so much. I appreciate right, thank it. Thank you, Senator. Thanks again to the senator uh, for joining us. So, so far, we've heard from two senators, one from New York, one from California, uh, unemployment insurance, pandemic unemployment assistance. Uh, again, it's all up in the air because our states uh, received guidance from the federal government too late. And also the systems that the state has historically had in place, um, you know, have, are, are outdated. They need to be updated uh, to ensure that they're able to process your claims properly. So it's going to take uh, a little bit of time. Certain states are, are already ramping up and making sure that you're able to apply properly, but others are going to need another week or two uh, to ensure they have the right applications up. The advice that we've heard from California is that you, you must, uh, you, what you should do is uh, uh, create your profile, have it ready so that when it, it does come time for you to be able to properly apply, uh, you'll have that set up to be able to do that. So go on EDD's website, uh, create your profile, create um, your account, uh, and then hopefully in the next in the next week or so, uh, the application will be up for you to be to be able to uh, get your funding. Uh, New York, I believe, this past Friday, um, update upgraded their their websites and and their system, so you're able to go now to the New York's uh, Department of Labor's website. Um, and let me just go through some points. I know we have a we have a, a lawyer. His name is Jr. Uh, who who is going to join us and give us advice on how you can claim uh, all of the unpaid invoices and contracts that you have before, before the pandemic hit. I know a lot of us are still waiting to get paid. Don't know what your, your, what your, what your legal options are, uh, but he, he, is, he is joining us to give us some advice. Um, if you're out there, uh, please just send, us, send me a message so I can find you and be able to add you onto the, onto the chat. Um, and let me just go through some top line stuff regarding unemployment insurance. Um, this is an important one. If you get a, if you applied and and you get a call and the call is blocked and it's a private number, answer the phone uh, because it, it most likely could be the state. Uh, all right, now I have Jr. who's here. Let me bring him on again. So if you get a private call, answer the call because it could be the state uh, trying to get get in touch with you uh, to follow up on your application. Hey, JR, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Rafael? Good. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time and also being a contributor to the blog and, and, and giving us information uh, about how we can deal with the pandemic and, and claim those the, that claim the funding of, of the claim the wages of the work that we've done already. So, you know, I, I, we received a lot of a lot of questions around, you know, what legal recourse can people take uh, for those outstanding invoices? You know, everyone uh, wants to be able to get the cash so they can pay their bills, especially now. Uh, more than ever. Uh, so can you can you uh, please uh, shed some light and uh, give us some advice? Sure. Well, first, um, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for hosting and thanks to the Freelancers Union. Um, uh, as you said, my name is J.R. Skorbonik. I'm an attorney here in New York City. Um, I uh, have a, a service called Pay Me NYC. Um, I, I'm an attorney that uh, dedicated specifically to helping freelancers collect their unpaid invoices. Um, as you know, we have the Freelancers and Free Act in New York, which is a fantastic law that um, I've been trying to spread the word about um, to help freelancers know about their rights to getting paid. Um, for anyone who doesn't know about the Freelancers and Free Act, it's a, it's a great law. It has two main provisions. The first is it has mandatory attorney's fees. And the second is it has mandatory double damages. So unless your contract says otherwise, um, and you're an unpaid freelancer, if you did the work, you're entitled to double the value of your work automatically. 
Um, now, a lot of states and cities don't have similar laws. In fact, to my knowledge, I, I, mean, I think you were mm -hmm. kind of championing this law or, or one of the people to start it. I, I think it's the first of its kind in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're in New York, read up on that law. It's super helpful and super powerful to getting paid. If you're not in New York, um, I mean, I, I could talk generally about yeah. um, sort of pressuring your clients to, to pay without breaking your relationship with them. Um, I have a couple of pieces of advice. Um, first is be polite and professional, but also be firm. Um, a lot of our clients, um, you know, nobody wants to go after their own client, but uh, I, I have a lot of people that are referred to me that, you know, they have clients that didn't pay them from six months or nine months ago pre-coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about personal relationships and you want to try and work with your client, of course. Um, but if they're, if they weren't paying you pre-coronavirus, it's probably time to start ramping up the pressure on them. So what I advise people to do is, um, you know, start politely requesting payment. If you haven't already sent an invoice, send an invoice. Put terms on that invoice like net 15 or net 30 saying, hey, this is due in 15 days or this is due in 30 days. If it's not paid, start following up and asking why it hasn't been paid. Um, it can also be helpful to reach out to different uh, individuals within the organization. If your client is a larger organization, you know, um, your client contact is good, but if you need to escalate it um, to a CEO or a CFO or, or, you know, an account manager or someone in between, that can be helpful. Um, and eventually, it's a process whereby you just you always remain polite, always remain professional. But it's a process whereby you say, I, I get to a point where I have no choice but to take legal recourse. And, um, you know, in order to protect myself. And it's going to become clear at some point that they're just not going to pay you. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I'm happy to answer other questions um, that, that any of the commenters might have or that you might have. But um, Yeah. So have but, you, have in your experience in the past few weeks, have you had cases where people were able to collect uh, payments from, from outstanding invoices, whether it be using the Freelancers and Free Act in here in New York City or in, in other, other city or state? Right now, I'm seeing more and more freelancers being unable to collect because, mm -hmm. because of the virus. Uh, and, and, and candidly, the virus is a legitimate excuse, I would, in my opinion, for work that you did, um, you know, just six weeks ago. It's a limited excuse. Right. Um, but I have other people that contact me that haven't been paid mid-2019, um, even work that hasn't been paid for in 2018. Those people, I'm, I'm suggesting that it's, it's time that they, you know, get aggressive on collecting those invoices, whether they're using the Freelancers and Free Act or not, um, because I think it's become clear that those clients aren't, aren't paying at this point. Right. So the Freelancers and Free Act here in New York uh, provides that legal recourse, and the city helps intervene and, and helps collect and, and helps issue fines to those who are not paying on time. Uh, do you see that law playing uh, an important role in other cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco and, and uh, Atlanta, Philadelphia, where we have large pockets of freelancers? Do you think it's something that should be pursued and legislators should take on there because of how effective it has been here in New York? Absolutely. And I think that gets to your point about um, organizing. I think it's a great time for freelancers to organize. The, the Freelancers and Free Act, really what it does is it allocates risk. So right now, um, I think we all know freelancers tend to be last in the chain to get paid. You know, mm -hmm. the CEOs get paid first and then the employees get paid. And then if there's money left over, the freelancers get paid. Well, what the Freelancers and Free Act says is that it's not the freelancer's problem if, if their client doesn't get paid or if their client has funding issues. That's, that's, that's the client's problem. It reallocates that risk and um, it provides an incentive for freelancers to get paid quicker and to be paid in full. And so I think those, those cities, uh, you know, Los Angeles, Seattle, any, any other big city that has a lot of freelancers, th those kind of laws would be very helpful. All right, so, you're, you're, so overall you encourage everyone uh, to reach out uh, to, to, those, to those folks who have not paid them as of yet. Uh, be firm, um, tell them that you're expecting to, be, to receive payment 
And if you don't get a response, try to go to the higher ups and hopefully uh, that would work in your favor. Correct. And I think there's a stigma around filing lawsuits, but unfortunately that's kind of the system that we live in uh, in America and people, that's, that's how you exercise your right is you go to court. So I'd encourage people, you know, the amount of the invoice matters, of course, you know, if you're owed tens of thousands of dollars, you're going to have to be more aggressive than if you're owed a smaller amount, but every little amount counts. And, and, and claims are pretty easy for people to pursue in small claims court. Um, it, it, you know, if people will just kind of Google small claims court, my city, there's all sorts of guides out there. I know the freelancers union has a lot of good, um, they have a good template for a sample demand letter. They have a guide for uh, managing small claims court. Um, so again, it's, it's kind of an individual choice as to whether or not someone wants to pursue their rights, when and how. But at a certain point, you, you, you have no other choice. If you yeah. want to get paid on this invoice, you have to go to court. Yeah, and I think what's great about the Freelancers and Free Act here in New York City is that it protects you from retaliation, right? Uh, so they can't retaliate against you uh, because you're, you're asking for payment and that, that protects right. you. And should, should be able to take, take, take away some of that anxiety. Uh, of making right. that out. If they do retaliate, that's a separate violation of the law. Um, and it just entitles you to more money. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing you mentioned earlier is that for, you know, for like repeat abusers, the city can actually intervene in the lawsuit and fine, fine people additional amounts of money. Um, so one thing that happens is people use agencies to try and get around it. Um, I see a lot of um, you know, hair and makeup artists that the client maybe hires the agency and then the agency hires the freelancer. And the freelancer is like, well, I don't know who to go after. Um, that's a common question that I see. And, mm -hmm. and I think the answer is, again, politely and professionally, you have to go after both. Because if you've done the work, um, somebody has an obligation to pay you. Mm -hmm. So the attitude should be, you know, I've done what I was supposed to do. I delivered a quality product. You didn't complain about it when I delivered it. Somebody has the obligation to pay me. And, and the easiest thing to do is to pursue it amongst both of them and make them point the finger at each other. Right. Well, thank you, JR. Appreciate it. That information was super helpful. Again, uh, he's written a blog for us at blog.freelancersunion.org, uh, where he highlights uh, some tips and tricks on, on how you can get paid. And you can also reach out to him. Uh, to get more information. So thank you, JR. I really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for the time. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy to answer any other questions anyone might have. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. All right. So yeah, reach out to JR. Uh, we want to shout out what, what your Instagram handle is. Yeah, it's pay underscore me underscore NYC. And any questions that anyone has below that I, I'll continue to answer uh, on my own stories. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, JR. Thank you. All right, bye. bye. All right, guys, so I'm going to wrap up uh, pretty soon only because uh, Instagram Live only gives us about an hour uh, to host. To host, So I actually received some questions, and we highlighted about three or four questions uh, around PPP and UI uh, that were very common in the list. Again, we received over 300 questions. Uh, our team is going to uh, look through these questions and be able to uh, respond to them and get you the specific answers that you need. There's a lot of nuances in some, in some of your questions, but I think overall we can take a general approach and hopefully that answers a lot of your questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, a sole, as a sole proprietor or a partner in a partnership, if we, have no if we have no employees, how do we, sorry, if we have no employees, how do we prove that the PPP money was used for wages since the owner would be the only employee and they can't be on payroll. Um, so again, if you're a self-employed person, what your revenue you earn and the revenue you pay yourself, that is the payroll. That is uh, what the Paycheck Prote Protection Program is going to cover. So for example, uh, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, bringing in $5,000 a month on average, uh, that, is, that is what you should be reporting um, to, for the PPP loan and qualify that as, as wages for, uh, for yourself. So if you're self-employed, the wages is, is, your, is your own revenue. 
So hopefully that answers that question. Another question, my business is okay for now, but I'll probably feel the impact of COVID-19 in the next quarter or two. Um, will there be any relief funds left for me if I decide to apply in May? I encourage everyone uh, to apply for these programs now, especially if you expect that down the road, you're going to uh, lose revenue because of this crisis. Uh, it's important you get your application in now because these are programs uh, that are limited in funds. Uh, there was only a certain amount of money that was put in place by the federal government, and it's a first come first serve. First come first. It's happening in a first come first serve. First serve basis. Uh, what we are advocating as a union is that when the federal government reconvenes to talk about uh, what are the next steps to provide relief, we're going to need all of you to work with us to advocate uh, for more money uh, to be put into these relief programs like PPP and UI, PUA, so that, so that everyone who applies and everyone who's in need will be able to qualify at the end of the day. I think it's only fair and it's just the right thing to do. Uh, so we're going to count on you to help us with that advocacy uh, down the line. So yes, apply now, even if you think that in May, that, that it won't be a month or two until you, you, you believe you'll start losing business. You should apply, uh, get your application in, uh, and make yourself available to those funds. Um, so now we have some questions about the future. What's next? What are you hoping to achieve at the state level and locally uh, for New York? And we have to, um, as a union, uh, sit down and look at what are the next uh, per, uh, advocacy priorities for, for us to push for that will further provide relief uh, for, for freelance workers and just overall the public in general. I think one of the issues uh, we're looking at is the is suspending rent um, in New York. It's a bill that was introduced a little about, about a few weeks ago, uh, but it's a bill that can apply to every state across the country. Uh, so we're going to be looking at that bill closely. I think it's the right thing to do. You know, right now there are moratoriums so that you won't get evicted. Uh, but those moratoriums don't guarantee that you're going to have the money to pay the rent three months down the line uh, when you start, when you get, when you get a job or when you start collecting unemployment insurance. So we have to find a way we can suspend rents at, 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 no, at, at no penalty uh, to tenants. So this is something that's being spoken about in New York, but I, I'm sure that we can we can push this in California, in Texas, in Georgia, in Tennessee, and in all of the states across the country uh, where where people need real relief. Uh, so yes, yeah, suspending rent is one of those issues we're, we're going to focus on. I think that this pandemic has also shed light on the need for unemployment insurance for self-employed people. Um, it wasn't until the, the the CARES Act until until our government has actually put forward a plan to provide unemployment insurance uh, to uh, self-employed people, especially during pandemics like this. How can we use this moment uh, to advocate for our states uh, to uh, make this a, per a permanent thing post-COVID? Um, you know, we might have uh, other pandemics coming online, whether whether it be whether it be uh, due due because of weather or because of virus again, or even just in general. Why why not have a conversation on why self-employed people could not be included in unemployment insurance. So uh, that's, so suspending rent, expanding unemployment insurance for the long run, I think is an important one that we should look at. And we're going to work internally uh, to create messaging and see what that looks like. But we're all going to depend on you again, uh, to reach out to your local elected officials and use your voice uh, to make those things a reality. Um, and then the last question, I mentioned this earlier in, in, in the conversation, uh, but in case you weren't here, it talks about double dipping into all of the programs that exist, uh, whether you should apply for all of them. Um, there is no issue with applying for every single program. There's an issue with accepting every single program. So for example, if you qualify for e EIDL uh, and you qualify for PPP, you can only choose one. Uh, because they're both at the end of the day are, are considered, it could be turned into grants and it's funding to help you uh, keep your business afloat and keep yourself afloat. Uh, so if you're, if you're accepting grants, you can only choose one grant. Otherwise, it'll be double dipping. If you apply for all of them and you get accepted to all of them, you can only choose one. Um, if you are claiming un un unemployment insurance and you want to apply for these loans, 
you can do that as you can do that as you can do it as well. There is no guidance prohibiting you from you taking unemployment insurance and taking one of these loans as as of now. So I encourage you to apply for both. I have ten seconds remaining. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. I hope to do this again soon and have more people speaking. Uh, but please stay in touch. Uh, email us if you have any questions, and we'll answer your questions.